Hello, and welcome back to the Self Healer Soundboard. This week's episode is another direct request from you, the viewer or listener. This was a comment left in response to one of our clips on the Self Healer Soundboard Instagram. So if you have not seen us on Instagram yet, we are at selfhealers.soundboard. We post a clip from the newest episode every day, but we also can engage with you in DMs and comments and interact. So this was in response to our episode on dealing with resentment. Then came a question about heartbreak, which I think is a natural flow. Many of us who have experienced that resentment, um, we notice how that feels in our heart. And on the other side of resentment can lead to heartbreak. So we're opening a discussion about heartbreak and specifically how to heal from heartbreak. I think really naturally a great place to start with a conversation around heartbreak is to honor that a lot of us have the experience of a broken heart, usually when there's an ending, a perceived loss, um, an unmet expectation. And ultimately, as all feelings, they happen in our body. When we're having an emotion, there's a physiological shift and change that's very real, regardless of where the perceived loss happened or what emotions are wrapped up in there. Anything from sadness to grief to anger, I'm imagining resentment gets balled up in there for a lot of us really embodies then this experience of the emotional fallout of loss, ultimately. I think heartbreak definitely translates, for me at least, to grief. It is a loss and a, I guess a deep sadness or a breaking of maybe expectations that we had that didn't get fulfilled or of someone or something's actual presence. And the ending of that or the removal of that does shift and change things. And if it shifts and changes things for us externally, it's also happening internally. And specifically, if we're in like a relationship with someone else and we're dealing with a heartbreak or a change where we're no longer with that person or in the presence of that person, if it was a relationship that we are now mourning, there was some depth of love there. And our body actually receives that love as chemical messengers. We respond to that. And that lack then of those neurotransmitters coming to you puts a spike in cortisol, puts a response into your body where you then maybe have indigestion or an upset stomach, or you are anxious, or you have all of these physical responses, physical symptoms of that said heartache that your body is actually responding to physiologically, along with the thoughts of the loss and what could have happened or the future that will no longer be. I really appreciate you, Jenna, and in introing the body into this conversation because a lot of times our emotions do translate to an upset stomach, an inability to eat, to sleep, where we actually see these systems being impacted based on our emotional experience. And there's a very real scientific reason for this. Um, our heart is actually is more powerful than even our brain in terms of its electromagnetic reach. Um, sending those unseen signals out and receiving them from our environment. It's actually one of the first organs or systems that changes in, in terms of its rhythm in response to how we're experiencing the, the environment, the relationships around us. And when we're experiencing stress, sadness, anger in particular, our heart's rhythm actually is the first thing that changes physiologically in our body. And then our mind scanning our body for those physiological changes interprets that change and assigns the meaning of I'm sad in this moment. So the physiological impact of our emotions is, is very real. And when we're in that state, it's referred to in science as incoherence. Um, the messages sent from our heart to our brain are erratic, and they actually do then contribute to how we're showing up in the world when we're in that actual physiological state of differing activation or differing messengers or differing coherence. And on the contrary of that is when we experience things like love and joy or happiness, our heart actually emits a rhythm that is called a heart coherent rhythm pattern. It is an actual flow that looks like a nice harmonious wave. That's the experience. It's the actual wavelength that our heart gives off when we are experiencing that love, when we're receiving those messengers, those neurotransmitters of that environment. And with the absence of that, or with then an upset now, or a giant shift in that heartache and that loss and that grief, 
I think an understanding of the physical self, of that heart, of that heart coherence, and of our physical symptoms allows us to better understand ourselves and know ourselves so that when we are experiencing something tumultuous or we're experiencing that, you know, fall to your knees, really gutted heartbreak feeling, we can now have at least a hovering or a beginning awareness of what's happening internally. That while we're feeling this way and we feel completely gutted and broken, at least for me, it's been really helpful to understand what's happening internally to my body so that I then can start to put one foot in front of the other and create ways to nourish myself, to bring myself back into balance, to find ways to give myself that love and compassion that is perceived to be lost within that heartbreak. And why it's so important to do so is because my physical body, my nervous system is now, it's dependent on me doing that. If I don't give it that, then it's just out of lack. It's going to stay in that dysfunction, in that heartbreak, that chaos, which does have a physical impact on our body. So with awareness of it, we then can actually create space to give ourselves what we need, which is actually giving this physical vessel of myself what it needs to function properly. I think what's so important about that beautiful awareness that you're sharing with us all, Jenna, is on the heels or in these incoherent moments, a couple things happen that I think can be really prob- problematic for ourselves and the relationships around us. And one of the major things that happens is we lose the ability to think logically, to stay regulated and grounded. And on the other side of that, what we typically then act up, end up acting like is very impulsive, erratic. We react from our emotions. And of course, then the impact to ourselves in terms of how are we caring for ourselves in those impulsive moments. And of course, to our loved ones can be really great and can bring a lot of shame. We don't know why, right? We're just erupting from this really heartbroken place when for a lot of us, that's what happens. And what's so beautiful, even hearing you use the word compassion, um, compassion is one of those feelings that like you're saying, generates coherence. So when we're talking about right? If you're hearing us say, oh, well, if we're sad, we're incoherent, right? That's going to have all of these impacts on ourselves and how we're showing up in the world. The beautiful place of this is if we acknowledge that sadness with compassion, if we actually hold space for our sadness, now we're actually changing that rhythm back into one of coherence. Unfortunately, though, what a lot of us do is we judge our sadness. We judge our grief. We judge our heartbreak. And then we judge our reactivity in the world around us And really the beautiful work of healing happens when we embody that space of compassion, when we're able to, like you're saying, be that hovering awareness that I am heartbroken. I have these physiological sensations and changes. I have these emotional feelings that are happening. There's these instincts of what I want to say and do as a result of it. And if I can expand in that space and just be compassionately present, then actually physiologically, I'm I'm giving myself a great gift. I'm sending my rhythm back into that coherence, making space for more logical thought, more grounded action and more compassion than in how I show up in the world around me. It's beautiful to hear you talk. And I can imagine for those, I'm I'm laughing at my own self in moments when I'm in like really gutted heartbreak and I can picture myself like, you know, especially after Jake's death, it felt like my heart was literally ripped out. So I think of moments like that, and particularly for then people who are experiencing that depth of heartbreak, which I think we all have, whether it was the loss of a loved one, a a pet, or anything really that will be unique to you, it's very difficult to hear then, oh, well, I could just, you know, muster up compassion when I actually don't have an ability to have that. And what has been so helpful, I think just always for me is, again, that contrast and the polarity. I have always learned from contrast. And to the depth of a sadness or a brokenness I can feel, I'm also very quick now because of just consistent practice. This is how my brain works over so many years. I know that I only know that sadness and the depth of it and that despair because I've known the opposite of that heightenedness of the happiness and the love and the compassion that you're speaking of. So in the same moment that it feels like sadness is all consuming me and everything else is out of reach, I can remind myself that sadness 
is there because compassion's also there too. The opposite of what I'm experiencing is there and just as present with me in that moment as the thing I'm experiencing. Because if the opposite of it didn't exist, then I wouldn't be able to experience the sadness in that moment. And ultimately, the the greatest gift in that moment for some of us was compassionate action in that moment for most of us is just to be with, allow in presence the emotions, the feelings, the visceral feelings often of that heartbreak. Just to be clear, compassion doesn't necessarily mean removing the feelings for a lot of us. And the most healing gift can be sitting aside of ourselves in our own presence, whether or not we have those safe others then to share an extension of this then can be seeking support bringing our heartbreak to our relationship, sharing how we're feeling. Again, not necessarily looking for anyone to shift or change or even possibly they can't shift or change or make better the loss that has happened. However, being joined in. And that can begin with us joining ourselves in our own presence. Because I know just speaking from my own past experience, I'm the first person to check out when I'm having an emotional experience. I'm the first person to desert my emotions because I learned very early on in childhood that most emotions are overwhelming and the safest space is far from my body, far from the sensation. So the gesture of compassion for me is just sharing presence with my grief, with my heartbreak, with my deep rooted, maybe even anger over the loss that has happened or whatever has occurred. And that is a very, very compassionate embodiment, especially for all of us who didn't have that attunement what we're showing that younger self in that moment is that safety, is the ability to be in our own presence with the entirety of our very painful, physical, visceral feelings. Heartbreak's a great opportunity to show up for yourself, to be able maybe for the first time to actually be with yourself. Because for many people, and depending on the depth of whatever heartbreak we're talking about, that can be rock bottom for some people. That can be the thing that that cracks you open and and does shift or awaken something in you or alters how you move forward. Heartbreak in any relationship certainly impacts us in our personality and our personality also impacts how we respond to heartbreak, how we respond to the people around us and in moments of that despair or that, you know, just that gut-wrenching feeling of that rock bottom, I see it as such a major opportunity, which is where, you know, we've talked before about not wanting to swoop in and enable or save someone else because sometimes it is that hitting rock bottom that allows you to see clearly, that allows you to actually see yourself for the first time. I just want to also offer the um, opportunity for everyone listening to expand the conversation outside even of loss in particular around relationships, because there's many things that we can feel brokenhearted around individually for ourselves, right? Paths in life that we're choosing for whatever reason, no longer to pursue imaginations or ideas about what our future would look like, or maybe about even about what our past once did look like. And of course, coming to the awareness of the reality of our experience. So there's many versions of heartbreak that I absolutely want to include in this conversation that can happen for us and for us alone, that can be our own individual journey of grieving whatever loss it is that might not even be attached to another person. And of course, in addition to creating the compassionate space For us to be with our feelings, this also then includes conversations around finding those other safe relationships, knowing that so many of us didn't have that attunement model, didn't have a depth of emotional connection or support in our childhood and are desperately, because all of us humans need the support of other individuals. So then these conversations include, how do I talk about my heartbreak with someone else? How do I share these aspects of my emotional experience, understanding that for many of us who didn't have that modeled and who don't then have that practice, that's going to feel really raw, really vulnerable. How do I then ask other people how to just hold space? Because what likely then happens when we share our pain with someone else, just like that part of ourself that wants to swoop in and fix it, we can activate that part in someone else. So all of this then conversation around how do I communicate? How do I allow in another person to stand next to me when I'm having these deep-rooted feelings of heartbreak? Which is 
takes an immense amount of courage. So kudos and a lot of applause to all of you who do allow someone else to be present with your heartache and with your grief. And the same applause for those of you who are not yet there and who are immersing in the inquiry of this and even just being with yourself. I know for me personally, I still I still take my own heartache and my own grief by myself. It is still very raw to me to to allow Nicole or Lolly to sit with me in my grief. And it's not like that's the end goal either. It's not like, oh, I'll be healed when I can allow that. Because for me, much like we recorded an episode on the cocoon stage of healing and Nicole and I kind of had different takes or different experiences of it. I loved that time of being by myself and going inward. And for Nicole, that felt very daunting and sort of haunting. So it's the same respect here where it's not like I've crossed a finish line the moment that I allow someone else to see my grief. That does take a tremendous amount of courage and vulnerability, though the most important thing is that you are in the presence of yourself and you allow yourself to be there for your own grief. I don't need an external person to witness my grief, to cross that finish line and get to all of that courage and boldness in my healing. I need to be able to sit with me and carve out the space to honor that I'm grieving and I just need to be with that and now choose how I'm going to respond. Everything that was just shared about connecting with another, allowing someone to witness your grief, whether or not that be you, that's all in the response to the heartache. And I can't emphasize this enough. Whenever we're talking about heartbreak, about no matter what scale, how big or how small, we're talking about something that's done, right? It's happened. We can't unhappen it. Now we have the presence and we have our response. You can go so many different directions. This is why I say it's such an opportunity. And I I cherish every time my heart breaks, which it's meant to, our hearts are literally meant to break over and over and over again. They continue to expand and learn and grow. And in each of those moments of of pain and of aching, there is a message there. There is very deeply kept wisdom within you, within your soul, within your heart's energy that has been trying to guide you behind the scenes this entire time. But life and conditioning and the noise of society tend to get in the way and we get disconnected from that inner voice that has really been here all along. I think one of the most beautiful outcomes of living through, whether it's one or numerous, consistent, never ending seeming heartbreaks is actually a conversation that we just had um, a little bit in your content teaching on the circle today um, with this idea of because so few of us had support in childhood. When we meet something stressful, especially as stressful or as big as, you know, feelings of heartbreak, the only memory that our mind and body have to go back to for many of us is that moment or that experience of being completely consumed and of overwhelm, of overwhelm. So there's a very real part of us that anytime we begin to feel something similar to the depth of those feelings that the only narrative our subconscious mind has to imagine is going to happen next is that same overwhelm. And so there's really something to be said in increasing our ability, our resilience, or in taking those small steps to climb ourselves out of these heartbroken moments in that rebuilding of that resilience or in that confidence. And now showing your adult self that while in childhood you were undersupported and these emotions did destabilize, even debilitate you, they took over your whole system. And now there's something incredibly powerful and empowering to be said about showing up in a different action, in the ability to, even if it feels like it's breaking you to your knees, in the ability to tolerate that and to begin to put your steps forward at some time into the future. Because ultimately what that does in a very psychological, in a very neurobiological way is you're actually now mapping on a new experience of safety around these very big, very overwhelming experiences. And again, for many of us, it's holding the compassionate space that we didn't have that, that these feelings do feel like they will completely overwhelm, consume us in a way that they once did. And again, holding space for a new opportunity to make new choices only empowers ourselves to rebuild that lost confidence in ourself emotionally. 
If you're watching on YouTube, mm-hmm. Clark is our little orange cat has made his way into a cameo. Uh, my mouth started to quiver a little. I was trying to smile and make it look like a smile, but it started to quiver a little as you're talking because I, Jake is such a perfect example here where, so Jake, for those of you who are just tuning in or don't know, is my brother who died in November. So it was maybe 10 months ago. And Jake had struggled with addiction for most of his life. That was absolutely a response to the deep trauma and abuse and neglect and dysfunction of our childhood. And while I had taken space from Jake for many years, we had reconnected years ago because he was in recovery. He had been in recovery for about six or seven years and was doing the work that we're doing now and in a really great space. And What happened at the end of Jake's life, in the last year of his life, the relationship that he had been in during those years of recovery came to an end. And I know that for Jake, as you were just sharing, he catapulted back into little Jake. He was then frozen back in time in that experience of you know, not having a mother, not having a father, not having that care or having the one person who he loved the most and who he perceived to love him the most, his partner at the time, then to him felt abandoned. It was gone. And when it was ripped away, Jake was gutted. He was heartbroken. And in that heartbreak is when this spiral to then begin using again came back. And this is why I emphasize so much that our heartbreak or how do we heal from heartbreak all resides in the after. We can't unhappen it, right? It's done. But how we respond is the important part. Now, Jake wasn't wrong in any of his choices and how he responded. However, the choices in how he responded to cope with that heartache, which ultimately meant using, that is a direct result of the action that he took that was a direct coping mechanism of his heartbreak. Because when he experienced that heartbreak, his mind and body went immediately back into that little boy that had been abandoned. And he reached for the quickest coping skill that he knew, which was to to numb it and get rid of it. Now, at this point, he had made that choice so many times where the numbing and getting rid of it finalized his life. It was what ended up taking his last breath. So while it was a drug that did that, that took the last breath, it was the drug that was the result of a choice that was the result of a coping mechanism in response to heartbreak. And you can look at it super objectively, or you can look at it really dramatically, like the quiver in my voice here. I'm trying to take the drama out of it and just look at it really as objective as I can, because It is that serious. It is that important and that serious how we talk to ourselves, how we respond to ourselves. Because I know in that heartbreak, what came up for Jake was a litany of why Jake wasn't good enough, complete shaming for his addiction, how he was never worthy. He was never lovable. He was never good enough. The volume on those voices for him was turned up to the max. The volume on those voices are turned up to the max for many of us without even realizing it. And when we drop in and start to hear those voices in response to our heartbreak, the most important thing you can do is turn them down. And even in moments where it feels uncomfortable or like you're lying to yourself, turn up the volume of the loving voice, of being a nurturing inner parent to yourself, of being kind to yourself. Any moment that you begin ridiculing or critiquing yourself in response to already aching, you're adding to the heartbreak. You are now also responsible for consuming yourself in the heartbreak. So how you speak to yourself, I think, is the most tangible way when people say, well, how can I heal? Watch the way you're talking to yourself. If you're noticing it's harmful or it's negative, turn that volume down and start to speak to yourself in a loving and compassionate way. So bringing this conversation very much full circle. The way we heal from heartbreak begins with being in the heartbreak, with leaning into all of the different feelings, not shaming them, allowing ourselves to maybe for the first time in our adult lives, 
be present with how we're feeling without judgment, without shame, and allowing it to be, even including in those old habitual reactions, the things that we feel compelled to or we impulsively want to do on this feeling and just gradually, gently expanding the amount of time, the space, hitting pause, not reacting, giving ourselves the opportunity to see that pathway for that new choice, which for many of us begins an experiment. Um, for me, dropping into my body for the first time, I couldn't imagine. I didn't know how to begin to cope with any emotion outside of stress. And for stress, I had my spaceship that I know I didn't really want to check out on anymore. So it really was learning. How does sadness feel in my body? What are the visceral sensations of heartbreak? How can I learn to expand that space and just giving myself one or two more moments of being in that feeling? And then of can I begin to make a new choice that isn't disconnecting, that isn't suppressing or pushing down, or for me, just distracting myself with my endless to-do list of work? Can I look for a new way to allow my feelings that are inside of me to come out? Can I use movement? Can I increase the support or my utilization of the supportive relationships I have around me? And the list goes on. So this, for many of you, I hope this episode is an invitation first to begin to explore your heart your presence of your heart and all of the different feelings that get activated when we experience different degrees of loss, whether or not another person is included or whether or not it's just loss around our own self, our own future, our own identity, and learning how to be in that space compassionately, giving ourselves more of an opportunity to respond in ways that are more aligned with our heart. Um, we love if you're tuning in, whether it is on YouTube, and if you want to definitely see Clark, who has now settled into a complete nap on top of Jenna, um, checking us out on YouTube. He felt my heart energy. He felt your heart energy. I love that. It definitely feels like a universal sign that Clark mm -hmm. is literally laying on top of me. If you're viewing this on YouTube, you can see like a small baby <laughs> staring up at me. And he crawled over on top of my lap, actually, when my voice was breaking and I was talking about Jake. And he's laying on top of a mug that's on my lap uh, that is a photo on it of me and Jake and Josh, both of my brothers. So heart energy is real. That coherence emanates. It is felt in the world around you. And that a heartbreak is as well. And really quick, while we are ending the episode, I just want to note one thing you said about moving your body. Moving your body is so important. If you are able to move your body, move your body. If you're feeling stuck in those emotions and that aching, just move. Give yourself the gift of letting it release and move around. And if you can, go into nature. That cannot be emphasized enough. Being in nature itself is shown to reduce and lower your cortisol just by being in in it. So if you go sit outside for 20 minutes, that's supporting you. What you want to look at is how you can tend to yourself, how you can lower your cortisol, how you can actually nurture your body and moving it in nature, if you can, is one of the simplest and easy things. And why that sounds so simple, like, mm -hmm. oh, well, my heart aches and you're telling me to go to nature. We are because it really is impactful and effective. You are also a natural being. So you being in nature is you actually returning to your most natural state. And if you are listening to this and not on YouTube, I highly suggest you hop on over to check out our little Clark cat um, <laughs> and really see the physical result of these conversations on the beings around us. Clark is definitely a representation of that right now. Um, we appreciate all of your feedback, your comments, your engagement. We love being in this interactive conversation with you guys here on the soundboard. So your support and your sharing and engagement helps us get the word out and really continue these global conversations. We love you. We thank you. And we look forward to being with you again next week.